Hola a todos. Hello. Hello. Thank you. And, uh, thank you for all the good wishes that you've uh, given me in the stairs and the lift and the toilet even. So thank you. Thank you for accepting this madman to come and talk to you and makes your mind blow. So let me tell you that this was a great challenge for me because the question of uh, AI is uh, advancing and progressing so fast that uh, the only thing in recent years that has changed so much as AI is basically the, the place of uh, Sam Altman's office. <laughs> so if you haven't understood the joke, uh, well, just ask. Well, it's a very long talk, a little bit long. We're going to have an hour here. And I would like to start with this first uh, uh, photograph. You can also read us in AI. I've always thought about this since I was a small child. I always thought about things that usually don't think much about. And I wonder, what about that instant, that precise moment when the first human being of the planet who was aware of his existence perhaps stood at the river in the water, saw its reflection and realized it was him. That must have been an ultra marvelous moment. So I think that right from then onwards, we've always had this idea of why I think and why others think and why is it that this one doesn't think. This question of AI, which we call artificial, and I'm going to talk about that and say why it's artificial, it's been something that uh, has accompanied us all along our existence. And that has also made me think, how is it that we went from this, you know, people who uh, uh, whose most advanced technology was a fire, a bonfire, and to this little device with millions of transistors, uh, something that uh, fits in my nail. And what's happened is something that we all know. There have been much progress, always based on something before, and there have always been new things in mankind. But the funny thing about all this is that it's all these changes in history have become faster and faster. And initially, a change, uh, a notorious change, of course, would occur every 10,000 or 1,000 years. Now, since last century, things have started changing very fast. Every decade, every certain number of years. And now we are at a time where look what happened with, uh, you know, in, in, in just a couple of weeks, things happen. And one of the things uh, one of the ways of seeing this is this exponential graph. And we are at a time in mankind that when I think we're going to get to the uh, technological singularity, when we believe in uh, Im uh, intelligence that believe in themselves. Why did I put my question mark at the top there? I would like to go over some things that I said earlier. What am I talking about when I say that things are changing exponentially? Let's look at some figures in computing, in storing, and uh, in the field of telecom. And let's see how much we've changed. In computing, and let's compare everything we've got now with what we had uh, last century, in mid last century. The, uh, the, the, the iPhone and Android has uh, thousands of times, millions of times at the uh, supercomputer in the late 40s. That hard disk that you see, it's five megabytes. It's uh, one song of MP3. If we compare it with a hard disk that has five terabytes, it means that for every dollar, you have three million times more space. And as regards telecom, the initial internet in universities and the military would run 57,000 kilobytes per second. Now, the, the, the submarine in Japan is 300 million terabytes, which means 5.7 millions of millions of billions faster. And what's going to happen now? Well, 
And all that, all that is growing exponentially, and so we are getting into the era of artificial intelligence. And I would like to tell you what the f main five steps of AI that we've had since uh, m mid last century. First of all, we had expert systems. This was a l long list of if texts. If this, uh, that, if that, that. Then we go to neural networks, the first versions. These are some networks that were specific for a very specific task. For example, to recognize your handwriting, or as they do in Las Vegas, to know uh, the face of the players who they uh, expelled and shouldn't come back. Then we had machine learning, that is to detect patterns in data that are well formed, that are not chaotic, structured, yes. And then we have deep learning, which is a more advanced version. And this is for unstructured data, non-structured data. And, and then we have the GPTs. And this has taken us to the large language models. An interesting point is that, that this last step, unlike the previous four, there are new things that we can do. Now we are moving from uh, predictable systems to, to absolutely probabilistic systems. And we know that there are problems like hallucinations and so on. But what's the funny part of all this? Now, AI is not only to do things that we did better, now we can do things that we couldn't do before. Because this new type of uh, generative AI, precisely generative, comes from this. It can imagine, it can create things. Um, taking away that monopoly that because we thought that we were the only ones that could imagine things. So there are three large landmarks in AI that I can mention immediately. The first one was in 1996 when Gary Kasparov, who was a legend and the world uh, chess uh, player, lost uh, versus IBM Deep Blue. Now, the interesting thing is that after he it won, the society didn't believe it was an intelligent machine. And scientists said that uh, the machine won because it has a database of all the possible um, um, passes and movements that uh, can exist. Now, even now, we haven't got enough machines to store all the possible moves of a chess game. So that. Uh, that that machine could detect patterns from other masters and uh, win that uh, master. The second landmark has to do with, again with IBM in a uh, game where they would give you a question you have to ask and you have to answer it, and then uh, the machine won. We're not going to discuss that now. And then the last thing we know, Chat GPT. That was one of the largest landmarks. Before that, the two largest landmarks, it's iPhone, at least in my life, <laughs> the internet. And before that, computers and so on. But I would like to explain in a very simple manner what, it, what a GPT, a generative pre-trained transformer, well, it's important for you to understand. This was invented by Google, not OpenAI. And the idea was to create some kind of algorithm or system that, given a sentence, you could uh, end it. It could be ended with one further word or more words. And so, for instance, let me give you an example. The word pet uh, means two things in Spanish. It could be a small, a small uh, animal or a small notebook. Now, I found. Um, a uh, pet of 500 uh, years old in the library, and I could see that there were some mm, missing. Now, I found a pet that was lost, and it was uh, um, not walking well, and because it had a, an injury in its legs. Nobody at that time, uh, we thought that we were going to go about all those things. And how did that happen? Let's explain the large language models now. If I look at all these words, imagine that these are thousands, millions of words. None of them would mean much in isolation. 
But if I do this, blink, and I start connecting these words, there's magic occurring. This is done with a database. The idea is for each word to connect to other words in a context. Imagine that that is a three-dimensional image that I can rotate. I can see that mascot or pet is closer to legs and animals or closer to pencil and so on. How do you know that in the context you read? If it says legs, dog, animal, the model can understand that we're talking about a pet. But look at this. I wrote an article in a QR code, you can read it. The systems, when they become complex, give way to what we call emerging intelligence. Scientists did not imagine that when those data models had 10,000 or 1 million words or hundreds of millions of words, something miraculous happened. The model predicted the coming word, the coming uh, sentence or the coming paragraph or it could even reason. And this is very curious because kids also develop their intellect like that. When a child is born, the, the child learns words. When he gets to 200 or 300 words, a miracle occurs. From then on, he can relate with those few words, and his intellect grows, and he relates many more concepts in the world. And that is the famous GPT. So who are the large players in Chad's GPT? While I drink water, you read the screen. Microsoft, just in case you didn't know, is uh, the owner of 49% of OpenAI. Amazon has, uh, and Microsoft invested $13 billion so far in the company. Anthropic is a startup, it came out of nothing, and that's the model that competes most with Amazon. And Amazon has invested $4 million in that company. And they are developing boardroom, and they are also um, creating something else. So chat GPT is very important, and they have used it. It's quite complex. Google, in turn, launched its um, Google, and Gemini is the key name of a project that will compete at the same level as chat GPT. Meta Lama or Lama 2 in English is an open source model very much used worldwide. And finally, Elon Musk announced Grok, which is another competitor for chat GPT. So what is happening today with AI? I will give you some examples. You probably know them. But there is a wide array of things. The first is this one. This chatbot in the US is called Do Not Pay. Let's imagine I'm driving my car, I'm parked, and I see that I get a fine from a policeman. So I go to Do Not Pay, I explain what happened to me, and it starts having a dialogue with me, asking questions. And this case can be won, it says. So it prints all the legal document that I need, and I only have to sign the document. I go to the court, and I show the judge what happened. And thanks to that, millions of fines in the US didn't were not paid. Another interesting thing, look at this. I recorded this five years ago. It's a preview of what Apple Vision Pro will be next year. This chair that you see here literally is not there. It's done with increased reality. So we will use these goggles to look at this. The office is real, but the chair is fake. And this is done with AI. What we have here is very interesting. Suppose you have a house and you want to redesign a yard or a room. What about asking AI, give me options. I want this. I like this color. Let's see what happens. Watch this video. 
This is the picture of my house in Reimagine. Surprise me with a design. Or you can go to advanced options. You can choose the type of room it is, what kind of design you would like. You choose the colors and other elements you would like to see. In the end, modify the mask and you choose the part you want to modify and you say generate a new design. This was the result. We went from this to this and this. I wanted a swimming pool and this is one example. I put the swimming pool here or this space and you can do that with whatever you want. This was with a bathroom. Look at the results. Very nice, isn't it? And this is very simple. I love to watch old videos. Uh, this video was filmed in 1929 with a camera. And look at the movements. They were very cumbersome, awkward. And so it was changed, audio was added. Look at this very quickly. Look at the people at the time. These are real people at the uh, 1929. but we'll carry on. This is an NVIDIA technology providing chips of AI. In our software, I can get my cell phone and I film this place here. I give it to AI and it creates a three-dimensional model with you sitting there. And then I take this model and go everywhere, make a video game or be part of a film. That's wonderful. And what we have here is happening at this very minute in Harvard University. Just in case you don't know, the most popular course in the university is not business, it's programming. It's called Computer Science 50. And this year, they made a decision. Their objective is for each student to have a teacher. So there's no human professor now. They have a chatbot that teaches you to program. A teacher, the bot, is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, AI is being used to decipher uh, dead languages or languages we cannot read because we don't have enough human beings to read and translate the thousands and thousands of papyrus and other um, old languages. Um, the AI has a level of um, certainty of 97%. On the other hand, I need to talk about this company, Boston Dynamics, and this is the last robotic version and what it can do. This is so amazing that I have to tell you that there are no special effects. What you will see, even the end, is really happening. This is a demo. This gentleman says, whoops, I forgot my toolbox. So he gets a tablet and tells the uh, robot, bring it up. Look at this.
Incredible. And this gentleman, Tim Bauscher, probably never heard of him, but he produced a miracle. He, in only nine months, wrote 97 books, all published in Amazon with the help of Chat, GPT, and Mid Journey. This is how productive you can become. I won't. I don't know about the quality of the books, but anyway. And talking about Mid Journey, look at this picture here. These two, I made them, but not with a camera. I took the Mid Journey application. I wrote this in English and this in Spanish, and I got those images. See how far we can go. Similarly, if you want something more abstract, this is Jack Pollock and this is Picasso with Candido Bido, a Dominican artist. If you look at this video in future, you will find something similar. What you have here, if you're an architect and you need inspiration, give me something with a human DNA. And well, that's what I wrote. And here are the buildings. And I love this. I have a little dog at home, and I'd like to see it as a cheddar in Star Wars. And I wrote it, and, uh, and I said, create a creature of a politician. And uh, he created a rat with lots of money before it, <laughs> for some reason. Any similarity with reality is sheer coincidence. All right. More recently, some other things have occurred, and I decided instead of doing it myself, I'll ask the AI and ChatGPT and a very advanced voice app. I gave all the work and do this. According to a um, survey of GitHub, in, 200, in 2023, 92% of developers are already using AI tools to codify. Google Lens is already diagnosed in several conditions in the skin with AI. Gmail offers tools to help you write your emails. As regards Meta Music Gen has just released its AI tool, Music with Prompts, to generate music. In turn, Amazon started using AI generative AI to sum up the opinions that, their cu that its customers use. And as regards the EU, it uh, started a draft uh, uh, law to regulate AI. And uh, now the voice is, going, is being mixed up. And they will absorb between 17 and 16, 70 percent of uh, repetitive. Well, that's what happens when uh, AI competes with each other. I would like to say that that figure that you have there, 60 to 70 percent, it's uh, millions in Spanish, billions in Spanish. We use the larger scale in, in terms of millions. It's, it's 4.4 .4 trillion dollars. It's 4.4 uh, 4 millions of millions, so that's going to have a large impact. Now, if I continue, I, of course, I have to talk about chat GPT because that was the point, as Nicola said, that changed everything in the past few months. So I'm going to say very few things. You know that OpenAI was founded by Sam Altman and Elon Musk, who left the company. And something I found out recently, remember those words I, I interconnected to explain the LLMs? This has 1.76 billions of billions. Of course, they are, they are tokens. And all that quantity of tokens m makes it possible to make inferences, to think somewhat like a human being. Now, in one month, it broke the, the record of, of one, 100 million users downloading the app. And now, the, the balance between Microsoft and Google, until last year, Google had dominated Microsoft. But now, Microsoft, with its open air, 
AI has put uh, artificial intelligence on all its tools, and it's also hidden Google uh, where it hurts the most. Well, not here. Uh, Google's business, over 90% of its money comes literally from the searches we make. But if I say, hey, chat GPT, I would like to know the recipe of a Uruguayan Chivito. Well, uh, chat GPT would give it to me. Now, Google uh, would, uh, would uh, ask me to click on each one of the answers and so that it gets money. Now, imagine if we stop doing that. Chat has continued innovating with plugins. It's a way of uh, expanding ChatGPT to the external world and to be connected to other systems. I can tell ChatGPT, please uh, create a five-day uh, uh, holiday plan for Punta Cana, and this is my budget. And if I like it, I would say, I like it. Now make the reservations with Expedia. And if I have a plug-in with Expedia through OpenAI, and there is a commission, most certainly, we get uh, the reservation of the flight. Now, in this way, we can create our own version of chat GPT for one particular topic. So I saw one that was very funny and esoteric. Someone told chat GPT to behave as a, as a, as a wizard and, uh, and, uh, and behave like one. Or you can be a specialist in medicine or in uh, Genexus events, and I think uh, they did it on purpose or so on. But then, if you don't know this, I know that many people know that Chat GPT was programmed or up to 2021. And this month, it was announced that it was updated until April 2023. And something else that we have to know about is this famous hallucinations is that. The answers are not always true. But an interesting thing is that it's growing exponentially. I'm going to give you three examples. They're all academic. The first one is that George Mason University has a very popular course in economic. And they, in the 3.5 version, it got a D. And in uh, version 4, it got A in the exam. It has passed all academic tests, you know, the GRE, SAT, which I took a long time ago, LS, and so on. And the um, bar exam, which is one of the most difficult exams in the world for lawyers, passed it in the uh, border 10 percent in version 4, got 100 percent of, uh, of, of um, uh, marks. And this has uh, led us to a new uh, topic, which is called prompt engineering. I, I don't know what you call that in Spanish. It's a command line where you tell GPT what you want GPT to do. And that's taken from uh, uh, all the books and all the professions. They are offering $300,000 simply for you to know how to make the commands that you give GPT more efficient. Now, after continuing, uh, I would like to go back, and uh, and this is going to take a long time. Uh, this video, I, I don't know who attended the GX28, but I uh, invented a virtual assistant called the Genesis. Genesis. And this was five years ago, four years before ChatGPT. Many of the things that we are seeing in the latest version that was presented on GeneXus are there. And you're going to see things that haven't come out. And I hope that in the next few years, we're going to see them. So these are three videos. The first one is just to set the context. Let's see. How would uh, the Nexus app be in 2030? Well, I've chosen 2030 simply because it looks fine. Uh, but uh, I think it's going to happen much before that. And then I'm going to show you a 40-second um, video uh, f f for those of you who weren't there, just to see how, how I uh, we're going to generate a new app with mPlay standard. Excellent. For what industry and sector? 
for retail global, global retail. This would be a local or international platform. An international platform uh, located in the US and branches in all countries, virtual and physical. What kinds of products will you be selling in that platform? Now, the thing is that the, con the conversation went on and we interacted until we created a, 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 a whole app. It was this, then an escalator. And then after that, many things happened. Now, the end of that talk, it's four minutes. Let me warn you, but I think it's worthwhile watching because even if it's five years old, it's good to see what's coming next. Those who saw it, uh, then we are going to see it with very many different ideas in mind and everything that's happened with AI and chat GPT. Now it's incredible. That's just an overview of what's coming next. And now I would like you to go back and to make some observations of what I did and what truly happened in that conversation. So several things about it that we've just seen. Henixis recognized me immediately, and he knows the developer circle I will belong to and the privileges I have to do things. It recognized that Nagaston and Nicolas are in my working team. The other thing is that it lives absolutely in the cloud, so I don't have to have, I needn't a laptop with me. I can, I, any place I can have access to Genixis, I can continue working. The other thing is that it recognizes app patterns, so I don't have to be very explicit given too many details of the app. Um, I don't have to be verbose. I've never told Genexis, look, I have a column here with a price and another one with a subtotal. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't ask me that. It knows that uh, that's the way I would like it. The other thing is that it understands natural language, uh, you know, uh, jargon, idiosyncrasies, pauses, spontaneous uh, expressions, and even mistakes. It also understands the context. So depending on what I'm doing, the same sentence will be understood uh, differently. And the other thing is that it knows uh, development patterns and the rules, and so it knows what it requires. And so it says, well, this type of system is uh, is, is customer facing, and uh, uh, for those tablets, you need a graphic designer. Uh, since I haven't told it that, it reminded me. The other thing is that it knows how to integrate with third parties in an automated manner with, as I said, SAP or, or uh, IBM Watson or Mercado Libre. And, and this is implicit. Perhaps you haven't seen it in the app. But let's think about this. If Genexis lives in the cloud, and it's not only I making this app and uh, you and millions of people, this means that Genexis can learn from patterns for, from all the industries. So next time I'm going to make a Genexis app, Genexis has not only my own uh, knowledge, but the collective knowledge of all of you, except if you are uh, a company pro proprietor or owner. And it does this in a natural manner. It doesn't have to give me an Excel report with 30 pages. Don't give me 300 comments. Give me an excerpt. There are two things you have to pay attention to. That's what I'm interested in, just that. The other thing is that it suggests things that perhaps I've omitted based on the experience and uh, the past uh, that I had or Genesis, for instance, uh, suggesting the use of Amazon Torque. And another thing is where leaders are good, but not so many people working in companies. You know, those that are at the end of the line. Genesis knows that in this type of application, the idea was to increase sales. But in other types of apps, the goal could be to position my brand better or to make better entertaining or to obtain leases for future sales or reduce distribution costs. And on that basis, whenever it takes a pattern, what's the goal of this system, of this app? 
Is it to increase sales, to reduce costs? Is it customer engagement? What is it? The other thing is that it monitors automatically and proactively the app. So it releases me from that work. And Genix is, is useful apart from the beyond the development uh, side or part. Great, isn't it? I want you to draw the following conclusions. At that time, during that presentation, at the end, I talked to several people and said, that will not happen in 40 years' time. Well, see what we are doing with chat GPT? I will show you. This is another demonstration. Here, I would like to do a live prompt, so I hope it works. I would like to give you as many prompts as possible because I'm every day impressed by chat GPT. And I'm going to print it on the screen if you want to take pictures and play later on. I will ask it to create me a fictitious world like Thrones and Dragons and as I progress create the world around me. This is what I will do. I will choose chat GPT, the free version for the last week already does this. You can talk with it, so you can try it. Silence. Let's play an adventure game. You describe scenarios like drones and dragons, and I give you commands as to what I want to do. Do it full of emotion and battles and interesting weapons. Describe the places around me and the objects I can use, all in Spanish. Please respond in the same text block and allow me to interact with you through commands. Do not choose options for me. Uh, let me answer. I need a microphone. Let us start our adventure. You are in an old forest surrounded by trees. There are autumn leaves and you can hear a stream uh, at the back and the birds singing. You see a dark tower um, amidst the, in a misty atmosphere. Suddenly you hear a sound coming from the bushes. Some are ready to attack you. You have several options. Just face them with your sword or have a dialogue. Use the fog to hide or run away. What would you like to do? I want to fight against the goblins. Okay. Your your sword is ready. The goblins are evil. They come close to you. You know how to fight. Try a direct attack. It will favor it. Push them into the stream or use the branches. During the battle, remember that you also have a potion to heal if you're hurt. How will you face the goblins? Can I run away? If you want to continue the adventure, tell me. I am here to help you. So you got the point. If I say I want to run away, um, I could spend hours and hours being part of an adventure which is imagined by chat GPT. You understand what it means? It could have been a conversation with a client or maybe this is a type of thing that is mind-boggling. But let's continue. And if you believe that this was amazing, look at this. She continues talking. I have to stop her. She's still playing. Look at what Salt Owen said, Altman said in the annual event. He was asked, what's next? What do you think? What do you have in Ch ChatGPT? He said, 
What we launched today for GPT is going to look very quaint relative to what we're busy creating for you next year. So if this is chat GPT-4, imagine version 5. So we are halfway through the presentation. So this is the what's next event. So what's going to happen in the next 10 years? I'm going to uh, bring my crystal ball, which was created with our AI. I was stopped uh, outside in the corridor and I said, well, you were so successful predicting things in past events. Give us some lottery numbers. These are the numbers for the lottery. Where are my Mexican friends? There you have the numbers. However, this comes with a condition. 10% goes to me if you win. Now, let's be serious. This is very obvious. This is what we are seeing. The LLMs will be multimodal. What does that mean? When we talk to them, we can give them text, image, we can talk to them, send them Excel files, PDF, videos, but also I think, why not data? Why not use the blogins and use a, a connection to the customer service and ask them, what do the customers feel? What do my customers feel? You connect that to the database, you get good and bad comments, and you can have a summary. So copy several comments and then ask the program to give you a summary or a sentiment analysis, as it is called. Finally, with gestures, imagine that in the not very far away future, the camera is on, it looks at me and it asks me something, I make a face and it understands my face. So another thing is, regarding the output I will get, they will create voices, songs, books, videos, films, theater plays, interactive virtual experiences, reviving authors, comedians, band, musical bands, and so on. These are interactive virtual experiences. We have the 3D with the story and the adventure I imagined. If I use goggles, this is a new uh, fantasy world that is exactly how I like it. That's going to be wonderful. And if you want to sing like Shakira or Michael Jackson, do whatever you can and your voice will be accommodated and you will sound like Shakira and Michael Jackson. Or you may ask, the, make a new song for me that sounds like the Beatles and I want to see them playing. And that's uh, 3D virtual reality. It's going to be possible. And we will go from pre-trained GPTs to brains that will be free to learn in real time and long-term memory. When that occurs, we'll go to the first general artificial intelligence. And these entities will have their own identity and they will be aware, such as the man who saw himself in a mirror. They will realize they exist. When will this arrive? I will tell you at the end of my presentation. I also say that AI will exceed 99.99% .99 of um, all humans in terms of creativity. Look at this. Today, Chat GPT-4 passed the most demanding creativity test. And I say that that, that will always uh, be the case. The other thing is, it will also teach us many things better than other human beings. And this will change world education radically. We may ask for funds uh, to the United Nations for poor children to learn. Now you will have a technology that is almost free. And you will say, teach algebra to my child. It will be available 24 hours a day. It will follow your child's um, pace. 
and it will do it in such a way that he will understand and he can ask a thousand times the same question and the teacher will not be bothered. I can imagine a world like the one in the video. I can face a robot. That robot was very agile. In a few years' time, um, maybe I want to learn to dance, ballroom music or tango. Send me a robot to teach me at home. And this is what happens. That's wonderful. I will learn to dance salsa one day. I can dance bachata and merengue, but not the others. And this sentence we've seen before, the hottest new program language is English. And it says that uh, is for programming, but I will change that very slightly. The hottest new program language is natural language, whatever that is, French, English, Swahili. So for this purpose, I'll show you another video. If you've seen it before, uh, I was so surprised. Let's see what happens. See what this developer did. When the vision chat GPT appeared, he understood the visions, so he separated uh, uh, he, it wrote a flow chart and it made mistakes and if you look at the top to the left he said oh look this should go here and that should go there and also wrote instructions put my name here it was sent to chat GPT the code was generated executed and it worked <coughs> Aquí marcamos en la pizarra blanca estos cambios. Luego le pasé la foto a GPT. This right. So it generated the code. I pasted that in the BS. Um, and now watch this. So you're going to see step one here is enter your name. Check out the, the, the diagram here. So the model was able to see that I had these arrows and it actually flipped the order of these. Wow. I wanted to test if it could do that. And sure enough, it does. Now, if I do um, a name here, sorry, I'm trying to type with one hand and you're gonna see what is your email McKay, okay? You're gonna see in this step, I specified should refer to you by name once provided. A man so eso, it, eh? it flipped these steps, so it knew name, then email, and it knew once it got to email, it needed to refer to me by name. This is crazy, this is all on image. Um, I'm just gonna put some fake stuff here. You're gonna see, we now it's now asking us to confirm if we're over 18 or not, still referring to me by name. You're gonna see, I split that here. Um, so one branch goes up here to show the site, the other goes to um, the second option here, and you're going to see I crossed. Sorry. Pero bueno, quise parar ahí. Pero entendieron lo increíble. So do you understand how wonderful this is? It not only understood the handwritten uh, messages, it understood the arrows, the flow, and without any further instructions, this is what you wanted. However. There's one thing. This is the white elephant in the room. Hmm? Nobody pays attention. It's being ignored. And Nicolas mentioned this. How do we face the dilemma of hallucinations in critical mission software? If there had been an error and you run it, what happens? But if I want a system for an airline? With millions of code lines, I cannot depend on a chat GPT. Even if 99.99% is working, how do I know that that difference will start um, changing the whole um, reality of airlines? So, what I saw yesterday with GenXus Next is the most incredible solution I've seen so far to solve this type of situation. They took advantage of 75,000 rules of um, 
artificial intelligence to test what works, and they use the generative part for other parts of the system. This is a very consistent answer that I get from industry to solve that problem. So far, today, in 2023, Genexis is the only solution, the only company for large-scale systems that I have seen. So, Gaston, congratulations. <clears throat> and so, what are going to be the different types of LLMs of AI that we're going to see in the future? And I can identify a few. First thing is that I say they are informative and educational. That's what GPT is, it's generalized. But then we're going to have specific to certain domains. And for instance, in medicine, we're going to have super expert uh, AI in uh, treating cancer. And then we are also going to have something that for me is what I call entrepreneurial or private. There is a large opportunity at the same time when Bill Gates realized that I gave them windows, but now they need office. That's the office of AI. The fact that I've got a company and I say, wow, that's wonderful. I like chat GPT, but I want it for me, for my employees, for my customers. And there, uh, Nexus Enterprise AI is a solution that hits the target. We're going to have specific to apps, for instance, Spotify. Spotify, well, you know, I like uh, songs, but it's a little bit rough. But I imagine if I can tell Spotify, I'm a little melancholic and I like uh, songs similar to Sabina's. Because I, and I didn't tell Spotify who Sabina is because it knows. So it's going to give me more specialized things. Number five is environmental. What I mean by this is Alexa uh, to your place, AI for specific environments, your home, your car, perhaps a supermarket, the uh, ironmonger, uh, something that happens I have to ask and, uh, and say, where do I find this? And, uh, you know, sometimes my mother sends me to the supermarket to buy something and I don't know where they are. I have to find out. And it's very attentive what, what I'm, I, I know. You know, my wife knows that uh, uh, I go home and I sit down to watch television. Those are things that Alexa knows or that they will know. And the moment I sit down, the television will be turned on. Now, imagine a future where these glasses has uh, microphones and cameras and uh, hearing aids, and I could project uh, three-dimensional images you know, a light uh, version, and I can take it with me 24 hours a day. I can do things that uh, uh, would mean magic, but one of them, which I think is it calls my attention the most, is this. Imagine I tell my assistant, look, I'm going to have a child, and I want you to teach me to be the best father in the world. You know, I have certain parameters, and I explain that, and it says, okay. Then my child is born, and at three, when, he, when the boy turns three, he's a disaster, and the first thing I want to do is to hit him. I said, what child, what child, calm down. According to a study of 2007, you shouldn't shout at a child. And uh, I recommend that you do this or that, and uh, breathe or, you know, and probably gives me an electric shock. <laughs> but uh, perhaps I'm... An example that I gave you many years ago, perhaps I, 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 Gavi is there, and I, what's his name? And, uh, and then a bubble comes up with his name and probably a video the last time we met, because I forgot his name. And that looks like science fiction. Uh, in 2012, I was at a uh, Nexus event in Mexico, and it's going to be very important from now until the future, in the future. It's what we call invisible software and this interfaces of users. And I don't know who heard this famous story that uh, uh, when someone has a hammer, apparently all problems are nails. Uh, and I want to tell you a problem about Microsoft. 
Microsoft said, well, we have to go into the mobile space. We're talking about before Windows Phone. We're talking about Windows Mobile. And so on the screen, they would put in the same Windows interface with buttons and uh, mouse and a mouse pointer. And in your uh, uh, cell phone, you would have a little ball to move the mouse. But they didn't understand that that's another platform. What uh, Steve Jobs and Apple understood that they we need a different interface. Now, with AI, we need a different interface. Why? Why is it that we have to depend on screens and forms? And uh, I'm going to give you an example. Imagine that in a few years' time, I go into an old uh, bookshop, and I, I like Salvador Dali, and uh, I say, how much is this? $120. I'll give you a hundred, and he says, "Well, all right, okay, take it away." I take it and I do this. Instead of going to the teller uh, to make a queue and wait until they collect it and pay with my card and so on, instead of that, from the moment I have it in my hand and I say thank you, I walk out with the book. I walk out. Now, what happened? My AI knows that I'm in a shop, it's listening to me constantly, it knows that I'm do making a transaction in context, it knows that I have to pay, it knows the price, it communicates with a the AI of the shop, it makes the transaction, it makes payment, it probably pays taxes as well that you have to pay uh, the government, and it collects from me everything, and I went out. We could never see a... a teller with a form on a screen. Well, perhaps that's an option that I put in setting. Please put my put the price on my uh, glasses floating around. But imagine, uh, you know, uh, if that happened now, they would chase me, calling thief. Now, Arthur and Clark said uh, it's a sufficiently advanced technology without making a difference with magic. And I can give you a full talk about this concept because I love it. So we have to start thinking about new a new type of interfaces where there are no interfaces. They are this interface. No screens, but APIs behind the screen. And then what are we going to see later on? I am saying that AI, because of their own uh, will, are going to start experience with other types of intelligence, simply to experiment and uh, curious around, like the intelligence of organoids, quantic intelligence, um, and other types of intelligence that uh, we can't understand right now. We're also going to have uh, bidirectional Bain computer interface, BCI, it, that is a term that's been used for decades. And in the not distant future, we're going to have a bidirectional communication with AIs. And look at this. At Stanford University, they showed last February that there is a device where you put, in your, put it on your head, and you can write, but just thinking, 62 words per minute. Elon Musk, who is everywhere, even in the children's soup, has a company called Neuralink, whose purpose or mission is to merge human beings with machines. And uh, they, they had a permit from the US to start tests with human beings. And they showed a video where they implanted that to uh, that device to to a uh, to a uh, monkey, they they uh, they were playing a, a game with a little ball and come, that jumps up, and I am saying that BCI and augmented reality are going to be killer apps for what I'm saying. This this interfaces of users, imagine glasses like this, and I'm connected to AI, and uh, it's writing what I'm thinking. For instance, if I don't think about the solutions with this uh, humane AI uh, so that you can interact with AI. You have to be talking in public. No one wants to do that. 
I was on a plane editing my presentation. I don't want everyone to be watching what I'm doing or personal things. But the moment I can think about them and that they are written down, well, things are going to change. And for you to know, this is a university I gave. This is a, this is an example I gave you a long time ago from Berkeley University. This is a system that is connected to your mind, and it knows what you are imagining, what you are seeing. Uh, what you see in blue is three people who are using it, the horizontal lines. The blue uh, squares are the videos to train AI. And what you see in red up there, I'm going to see it here. I'm, I'm going to hide the, the blue part so that you focus on this one. The red one is a new video that they gave to the person and said, look, watch this video. And they put three people, these three uh, green boxes. And when, I'm, when I hit play, just check what the computer, AI, thinks you are seeing and compare it with what is at uh, the top. And this is version one. No audio, no audio. As you can see, it was a bit blurred in 2011. But look what's happening now, three universities. I haven't got a, a video. They're doing it with photographs. The line at the top is what the person sees the, at the bottom. This is what AI thinks you are watching or thinking. This means that in the future, you're not only going to be able to talk to AI, but you're also going to be able to imagine and think what you want the AI to do. It's a software or a design of a building. I imagine it and said, hmm, OK, fa, and that's it. That's magic. And in the long term, I think that there's going to come a moment where we won't know where the human being ends and then AI starts with bodies and minds that are synthetic and virtual environments merging everyone, particularly when we connect those machines and devices directly to our brains. And where are we heading to? Let me put it visually here. At a certain point in, on Earth and in the universes, there were molecules that started to self-replicate, and then we got small animals, not very complex, without intelligence, and then we got uh, us, and now we have a neural, or a neural network with intelligence, and we started uh, turning our intelligence into synthetic intelligence. And that's why we have this graph, which I've been using for a long time. This blue line here, this is the level of intelligence that we human beings have. Uh, and these are, this is the intelligence of machines. In blue, uh, we weren't that intelligent. And we, get, we got to this point. This was about a million years ago, and 100,000. And there, human beings started. We haven't changed much. And we know because we can analyze the uh, DNA of uh, human beings. But what's happened with uh, machines, they started in, with zero, at zero. And they, in the 60s, they became more and more and more intelligent. And now we're in 2023, perhaps somewhere here. And the question is, what's going to happen when these two lines uh, intersect? That's the, what we call uh, artificial intelligence. And people say that when uh, we get to this point, these, these, these uh, beings here are going to kill us all, or a nuclear bomb, and we're connected as batteries. Well, what I'm saying is, I can't tell you what's going to happen, but what I can tell you is that from now onwards, something can be, you know, we started in this curve, we uh, go into this one, and we're doing it. That's precisely what Elon Musk wants to do. Let's merge with our creations and let's create uh, humans 2.0. If we don't do that, Mathematically speaking, we know that that curve is going to go up and we are going to be there. So that's the option I think it's logical for us to carry on. And so this is a new era which is uh, being born.
2001 Space Odyssey. This is the Hull's eye. Uh, AI became a little bit mad and there, and, and the same thing is happening now. It's lots of uncertainty. We're going to lose jobs. We're going to be extinct. What's going to happen? And we can talk a little bit about this. Now, the first thing is that technology, any technology has two uh, sides. With that nuclear bomb, I can kill many people. And uh, AI, well, we'll see. And the hammer uh, can be used to kill someone or to build homes. Or And the knife can be used to uh, cook. And nuclear energy has allowed us to save thousands of people who had uh, breast cancer and, uh, and give electricity to millions of households and explore the cosmos which is uh, because it's using nuclear energy. And the question is, what happens with AI? Well, everything that is bad about AI, well, the first thing is that uh, there can be more uh, political weapons and war weapons and, uh, and so on. Criminals are using a new generation of malwares. You know, they are getting some emails, apparently written by your own mother, and they are so convincing that you click. Uh, well, fake news. We all know about this. Donald Trump knows about this. Uh, infringement of uh, copyright, infringement of your privacy, infringement of your security, and imagine that insurance companies could have access to all your data. Would you give you a medical insurance knowing that you have the probability of suffering from an illness? Well, or a company, which unfortunately this goes on happening, on the basis of cameras, movements, and patterns that perhaps we don't detect detect uh, uh, what you are like. And a company may say, I don't want you. Or the question is, could this AI destroy us? Will we get to apocalypses or a time where there is prosperity and freedom as it never happened before? And I say, well, this is my prediction, that if mankind is, uh, is able to live in the next 10 or 30 years, we will never uh, perish until the end of the universe because the AI and the talent we'll be able to create, we'll be able to come out and explore the universe and go on living until there is no useful energy uh, to be used. And then on the other hand, and then an example of how you can use technology badly. Uh, imagine a dictator of uh, North Korea making making uh, Barack Obama uh, saying something fake. At, uh, Michelle and I tried to teach our kids. Uh, yeah, you talked about what we talk about. Eso es totalmente generado por computadora, lo que ven allá. This has been generated by a computer. But what about the good things? We are going to see a lot of progress in all these things, you know, robotics, interface, education, astronomy, entrepreneurial sentence. And we can also see a similar technology to Obama's, in this case is Harrison Ford, how Indiana Jones 5 was, uh, became younger. It was me at that age. Paint of stuff to be. Y bueno, o oh, miren este. Oh, look at uh, this example. This company has already created, with artificial intelligence, created the first drug to treat patients with chronic lung diseases. And with artificial intelligence, we can um, multiply times ten, uh, a thousand the pace of medicine. And look at Goldman Sachs in a report published in March this year. They said that approximately 300 million people in the world will be affected by AI, and the percentage according to the type of jobs will be 46%, 47, 37. But at the same time, they're also saying they expect 7% increase in GDP in the world. How, how strange. Because you would say AI uh, was going to do away with jobs. So, for example, 
Look at this example. Uh, the two countries, South Korea and Germany, have the largest number of robots per capita in the world. But in the examples that I will give you, let's focus in Europe. We have Greece also in Europe, and Greece has the smallest number of robots per capita in the whole continent. Curiously enough, unemployment in Germany is the lowest and Greece is the highest. So it is inconsistent. The more robots you have, the more unemployment. Why does it happen? Let's look at the example. Let's talk about tomatoes in the Netherlands. The Netherlands is the largest tomato producer in Europe, but The average salary in Europe is twice than in a country like Spain. So if I'm paying twice um, the peasants, they are more productive and earn more money than those who charge half the price. The answer is technology. In the Netherlands, the tomato production is automated. Uh, they use AI in all the steps in all the, throughout the chain. And in the GDP of that country, the agricultural industry is the number one contributor to GDP. But you said, yes, there are no farmers, but they all have PhD degrees, and they create robots to do the labor, and they export to many other countries. Now, this is a study by the Bureau of Economy um, economic uh, research in the United States. They took over 5,000 people and gave them chat GPT. The result is here, 14% increase in the productivity of the company. And in India, in Bengaluru, this company gifted the employees with chat GPT because it was increasing five times its productivity because of that. And this other company, Freshworks, which is listed in NASDAQ, this, uh, chose a similar strategy with chat GPT. They delayed they reduced the time it took them to produce software in le to less than a week. And my last example, um, sales pitch. I have an idea. I want to convince Nicolas. I have only one minute to give my, my sales pitch. And said, well, use Ch chat GPT to write your pitch. And the other group wrote it itself. The result was they had those who used uh, chat gpt uh, are three times more likely to secure the deal and this leads me to this expression that's very important this is the takeaway of this session at this present time in your labor environment you will not be substituted by ai but you could be substituted by someone who does know how to use AI. Remember this message. To close this last session, there is philosophy to be shared with you. The time has come to talk about these things. So first, what is natural and what is artificial? Why do we call it artificial intelligence? Because we have the same atoms in the processor and in the um, servers. However, we are anthropocentric and we feel that we are privileged or different, but everything is natural. And natural um, orange juice and artificial orange juice, they are both natural. If we understand that, all other problems that seem complex will be simplified. Can an AI develop feelings and self-awareness? Why not? I say yes. There's one example. You know which example I'm referring to? We, ourselves, we are machines. All of us are machines with small molecules working and something else. And these AIs need, will have dreams, 
hopes and fears like anybody being. And the question is, should they enjoy human rights? Yes, of course, I believe so. Because we will have to um, ask for patents and create companies and all it involves. Should we regulate or control the power of AI? I think that's a stupid thing to do. Why? Because imagine Biden says in the States we have to stop research in terms of AI. China says, ha ha, let's carry on. Russia carries on and any young boy will carry on. So mm, that's a very stupid thing to do. Now, once we have AI, do you think we'll be able to control it? Very hardly. It's like a monkey trying to control human race. Another important thing, what are the ethical and moral values those AIs will have? How will they be trained? Under which beliefs? Um, what are we going to provide them with? Saying that human beings are good or bad, or this religion is good and that's bad, this is correct, this is not. We will have different types of AIs with different personalities, probably. This is what we see today. You will notice that. They, you, it feels different. And the question is, are some AIs more friendly than others? And something I ask myself, is rationality unavoidable at the highest level of awareness? Remember the curve I showed you as it moves up? Will it be normal for those beings that I have trained to say, oh, the Muslims are this or that? Will, will it understand and say, stop, that doesn't work, we are all equal? I hope that this is the case, but I'm not 100% of that. And the question is, are we going to have AI that is ultra-rational or ultra-fanatic? Can you imagine what will happen if we have ultra-fanatic? And an article that I wrote many years ago, there's a QR code that you can use. And the last question, are we really going to be um, human beings merged with artificial intelligence? I believe so, because first of all, we don't have the monopoly in terms of creativity. We said machines could not be creative, had no feelings, but that is changing. It has been demonstrated. And this merging has already started. Uh, I'm sure that 100% of of all here have technology, have cell phones. The only difference is that this is not sticking to my brain, but we depend on this. We have merged with our cell phones. So when will general artificial intelligence reach out to us? If it does not arrive in this decade, or if it arrives in this decade, it will not surprise us. Because I think we are almost there. And if it does not arrive in the next decade, it will really surprise me. So what I'm saying is that, in, give it 10 years' time. Finally, I will conclude with this same image. And we will extend the message. I said this guy here was looking at himself for the first time. But think about this. All of us, we have calcium in our bones. Um, we have iron in our blood, carbon came from stardust. Depending on the type of star, different elements got together, got to the Earth. Comets and meteorites bring those molecules and life appeared. So we are the universe itself. Your brain may say, well, independently of having hands and feet, we all are the universe that is thinking about itself. So artificial intelligence from a poetical or philosophical point of view is an unavoidable step in the evolution so that the universe is better understood. And this is my message. Thank you. <laughs>